recording and all righty welcome everyone to today's session on january 12 2023 so happy new year everyone this is the fourth session of the 2022-23 pre-test virtual training series sponsored by the california department of education or cde Today's session is focused on what's new for the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, or CAS testing. My name is Tina Nguyen, and I am from ETS on the District Training and Outreach Team. And today I am joined by a number of my colleagues from ETS in the CDE, as well as our LEA presenters um, from various districts. So you'll get a chance to meet them throughout this presentation as well. Let's get started. So welcome everyone. In the chat, we have um, the Padlet link in case you didn't see it. It's also presented on this slide at bit.ly slash pretest 011223. The slides and the resource guides are available for you to view and download from the Padlet. They're both posted on cast.org. Um, or lpac.org. You can find it in both places as well. You can use the slides or the resource guide to record information shared throughout the session. And once you download those um, slides, you'll notice that they all contain the presenter notes. So it contains all the key details and information we're going to give to you today so that you don't have to frantically take notes. And it's something that many folks have requested in the past. So I hope that really helps you all out. And then in the resource guide, we also have um, a various amounts of links and resources that we're going to um, talk about throughout this presentation. Additionally, at the end of that resource guide will be common acronyms and initialisms because we use a lot of those throughout the presentation and just in the world of assessment. So we define the acronyms upon first use of them in the presentation, and we try to refer to them as much as possible. But if you don't know what something means, you can refer to that back section of the resource guide. Most importantly, um, we'll be using that Padlet where you found the PowerPoint and the resource guide for our Q&A. So if you have any questions for us, the chat is not available to you, but the Padlet is. So you can go onto that Padlet to ask any of your questions and all of our LEA, LEA presenters and our ETS staff members and our CDE managers are looking at that Padlet and monitoring it to answer your questions. So that's something that um, will give you time to look at throughout the presentation during um, some downtime will give you time to process, go to the Padlet, add questions, and then look at your look at the answers to those questions. And um, you'll be able to refer to that Padlet even after this presentation is over. So that's why it's really important to just be um, to just make sure you add those add those questions to the Padlet. Last thing I'll note uh, is to keep in mind that this training is for local educational agency or LEA. CAST and LEA, um, sorry, LEA CAST coordinators. Um, so if you don't hold that role, you might notice that there's information in this presentation that you'll need to contact your LEA coordinator about. Um, okay, learning goals. Let's take a moment to review our learning goals for this session. By the end of the training today, participants will be able to understand updates to test administration systems, updates to test administration resources and what's new for the cast so this is a highly requested training so that we only talk about what's new and we have little tiny reminders that are really important throughout the presentation but for the most part everything we're going to be talking about is any updates to the system by the end of the today's training participants will be able to prepare systems for testing Update training materials for staff to include changes for the 2022-23 administration year. Plan and deliver training on how to administer the CAS, and plan for the assessment, plan for the completion of tasks, as well as how to prepare students for the assessments because the test administration window is open. So again, um, all the resources you need are on the Padlet, and we'll be having our Q and A there. So if you have any questions, go to that Padlet. Um, and put it in, and that link is in your chat. 
without further ado, I'll hand it over to our first LEA presenter to go through the CAS assessment. Give it to you, Moses. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Moses. I'm with the Los Angeles Unified School District, and I have the honor of being one of the LEA presenters. Uh, to start us off, uh, just some overview uh, and quick reminders about the CASP system itself. It consists of, as we know, the Smarter Balanced Summative Assessment for ELA, Language Arts and Literacy, and Mathematics. We'll be looking at the California Science Test, or one of those acronyms of the many CAST, and the California Alternate Assessments. And those for the CAAs come in ELA, Mathematics, and Science. And then the CAST system also has the California Spanish Assessments, or CSA, which is an optional test. And so we'll be looking at these in detail. The CASP administration windows, each assessment has its own set of administration rules. The test operations management system or TOMS is programmed to calculate the testing window for each assessment based on the administration year, the first day and last day of school, and a comprehensive list of the non-instructional dates. And so the Smarter Balanced for ELA Mathematics, the CAST and the CAAs for ELA Mathematics are scheduled to be available for the administration on January 10th, or as Tina already pointed out, they are open already, or once 66% of the instructional year is completed. For these assessments, each LEA sets its own ad test administration window. The statewide testing window end date is the last day of the school year or July 17th of 2023, whichever comes first. The 2022-23 Smarter Balanced Interim Assessments, they become available, they became available in August, on August 2nd, and they are available year round. Now, the CAA for Science administration window, it opened back on September 6th of 2022 and contains four embedded performance tasks or PTs that are expected to be administered following instruction. The four embedded PTs are intended to be administered throughout the year, but not all in one day or over consecutive days. A student is considered as having completed the assessment once all four embedded performance tasks are submitted. And we'll look at that a little bit more in detail in a few minutes. LEAs are automatically assigned the entire window and do not need to set up a unique window for the CAA for science. The statewide testing window end date is the last day of school or July 17th, whichever comes first. And then the CSA can be administered between January 10th, when it opened, or again, once 66% of the instructional year is completed. And the final day of the LEA's instructional calendar, or July 17th, again, whichever comes first. So these are the administration windows for the different assessments. Now, a little more in detail, looking at what's new for the Smarter Balanced Summative Assessments for ELA and Mathematics. During the September meeting, the State Board of Education, again this year, approved the use of the adjusted blueprints for the Smarter Balanced Summative Assessments for ELA and mathematics for the 22-23 test administration year. These blueprints, which are identical to the ones used during the 21-22 test administration year, are posted on the test development webpage of the Smarter Balance con of the Smarter Content Explorer website. And this link is provided in your resource guide. And I really want to make a pitch here that resource guide I just mentioned, and we will all be mentioning it many times. 
you really would want to take a look at it. If not right now, as we're going through it, definitely at some point in time, it is so rich in what it offers and we will all be referencing it. Now, the Smarter Balance score reporting. For the 22-23 school uh, test administration year, it will be the same as the reporting for the 21-22 test administration year, which based upon the adjusted blueprints means student score reports or the SSRs and the California Educator Reporting System or SIRS will not feature claim results. However, aggregate claim results for groups of 30 or more students will be shown on the public reporting website. So take a minute, think about that. And that target report and target reports in SIRS are being investigated as to the possibility for the 22-23 administration year. Now, some details about the California science test. It's administered to students in grades five, eight, and once in high school, in either grade 10, 11, or 12. Students are gonna complete discrete items and four PTs with at least one PT that covers each of the science domains, which are earth and space, life science, and physical science. Now, each PT includes a constructed response question that requires students to use their own words to answer it. We have the organization of the cast flyer. This is one of those great resources that, it's a, that is available to you in the resource guide. It provides information on exactly the segments and the discrete items and the PTs that the students will be exposed to. So please take a look at that flyer that's available in the resource guide that is linked to this presentation. Now, new this year, students in grades eight and or high school who are using the support called Stacked Spanish Translation will now have access to a Spanish version of the periodic table when taking the test. The printable version of the new Spanish periodic table is available for teachers to print for daily instruction. And again, the link to this resource can be found in your resource guide. So please take a look at that and make those new resources available to your teachers and schools. And lastly, of the assessments that we were talking about, the California Spanish assessment. The CSA is a Spanish reading language arts assessment that measures a student's literacy in Spanish reading language arts and it provides student level data in Spanish literacy. The targeted test taking population of the CSA consists of students in grades three through eight and high school students who are receiving instruction in Spanish. And there are no new updates to report on this assessment. Now, the CAA for Science, a few details or overview of this assessment. It is administered, as we know, as the state required science test and CAS system for students with most significant cognitive disabilities. Students are identified to take an alternate assessment by their individualized education program or their IEP team. And these students complete the CAA for science in grade five, grade eight, and once in high school in grade 10, 11, or 12. The CAA for science consists of four embedded PTs 
each covering the three domains in the next generation science standards. And the CAA for science was made available, as we've noted earlier, starting September 6th of 2022 and can be administered until the last day of instruction or July 17th, 2023, whichever comes first. Keep in mind the CAS pause rules do not apply for the CAA for science. However, the CAA for science embedded PTs, they do have a 45 day expiration timeline. The student uh, score reports or the SSRs, they will be available alongside the ELA and mathematics results release in summer of 2023 for the CAA for science. Now, the CAA for science, it's unique in that the embedded PTs are intended to be administered, as we said, throughout the year. After the related instruction has occurred in the assessed area. So this is an example of the timeline that shows how four embedded PTs can be administered throughout a year. For example, in October, January, April, and May. But however, the assigned PT will vary by grade and the embedded PTs can be administered in any order. This is just an example. It is not designed to be administered in one day or over consecutive days. The flexibility allows for testing to occur immediately following instruction in that topic area at different points in the year. The exact schedule should be determined by the LEA on the basis of when in the year each topic is taught or by the school site or even more ideally by the teacher and working with those students. As an, um, as an example, the teacher might use the administration planning guide to plan their instructional units based on the science connectors at different times throughout the year. The teacher then could work with the test site coordinator to schedule the CAA for science embedded performance tasks immediately following the planned instructional units spaced out throughout the year. Again, this flexibility allows for each student to be as successful as possible in showing an understanding of the science connectors in a timely manner following instruction. So consider how you can create an environment for sites and teachers to have this flexibility throughout the year. Perhaps it means giving teachers the time to plan for the upcoming school year early or reminding them on an ongoing basis of the availability of the CAA for science starting in September. The CAA for Science Administration Planning Guide that we just mentioned and the organization of the CAA for Science Flyer are both very helpful in creating a schedule for your LEAs. And links to both of these resources are available in your resource guide. Now, the CAA, similarly, the CAA for ELA and math are administered to students with the most cognitive, significant cognitive disabilities. The CAAs for ELA and math are available in grades three through eight and grade 11, and they are delivered one-on-one -on -one by a trained CAA test examiner that is familiar to the student. The CAAs for ELA and math are available at the same time as the Smarter Balance Assessments on January 10th, 2023, and can be administered until the last day of instruction or July 17th, whichever comes first. 
for the CAAs for ELA and math, testing should take approximately 60 to 100 minutes for each content area. Although these assessments are untimed and the amount of time each student needs can vary. Now this year, the number of forms has been reduced from five to just two forms for this year. And there is CAA for ELA second scoring. To support the reliability and validity of the CAA for ELA, a percentage of all rubric scored items are second scored. Second scoring is the process of having another test examiner score the same student's rubric scored items simultaneously with yet, but yet independently from the student's primary test examiner. Now these test examiners score approximately one to three items per test. And all scores are entered into the DEI, the data entry interface, by either the test examiner or the school's designated data entry personnel. There are two forms available for the CAA for ELA and math, and a subset of schools assigned to form two for the CAAs for ELA and math will be required to participate in this second scoring. And schools are assigned to second scoring will, will need to train and schedule an additional test examiner. And so it is very important, very important that the leaders of your special education department, as well as special education teachers, are aware of individualized in education programs or IEPs, decisions that may affect not only classroom instruction, but testing also. An IEP decision that's made in August might have big implications for what assessments a student takes in May. Each student needs the opportunity to receive instruction throughout the year with the appropriate designated supports or accommodations already in place. In addition to regular curricular resources, all students can practice in the actual system they will use for the summative assessments by going through the practice and training tests. The interim assessment blocks or IABs, focused IABs, and possibly even the interim comprehensive assessments or ICAs. Consider that each administration of one of these assessments is an opportunity for test site coordinators to ensure that students have appropriate resources available to successfully complete the assessments. This may include making sure that the embedded resources are activated in TOMS, but it also includes making sure that the appropriate people, settings, and things like multiplication tables or dictionaries are available for practice sessions as well as for the summative assessment. Make sure your special education department is aware of all the assessments and curricular resources that are available to assist students in learning and in measuring the progress of their learning. Additionally, working with your California Longitudinal Pupil Achievement Data System or CalPADS coordinator is essential in keeping student data accurate. Resources are available again in your resource guide. And finally, despite all of our efforts to coordinate with our CalPADS, student information system, special education team members, there are times when mistakes are gonna be made. This is especially true with special education testing. Now, for example, say a class has some students that are assigned to take the CAA and some to take the regular assessments. A student's IEP is updated 
And the student now needs to take the CAAs. This occurred after the student accidentally starts a smarter balance for ELA test instead of the CAA for ELA. This is a wonderful example that happens. In so the test site coordinator or LEA coordinator should find out some critical details and then initiate what is known as a security and test administration incident report in the system or stairs case. If you are unsure of an example like this, what to do, this is a good time to reach out to your success agent for help and guidance. At a minimum, you will need to know the following information if you are going to need to submit a stairs case. The student's grade level, how many students were affected, the statewide student identifiers of the students that were affected, the numbers, what assessments they were taking, was it LPAC, a CAA or Smarter Balance, what part of the assessment they were on. And it's also helpful if you know the session ID and name of the test examiner in cases when the person reporting an incident isn't sure how many students were impacted, as well as who to call for more information that's needed. So take a minute. We've all covered quite a bit already. We're gonna pause for a minute to allow for some processing time. Tina had mentioned the Padlet. It's a wonderful time to add any question that might have come to mind during what we've covered in this section to the Padlet, or to take a minute and check some previously entered questions and their responses. And again, another top opportunity to make a pitch that resource guide, if you have not taken a minute to look at it, my colleagues that are coming after me are going to be mentioning and referencing incredibly valuable resources that are connected right directly in that resource guide that Tina has shared the link. All right, thank you, Moses, for taking us through an overview of the CASP and talking a little bit about what's new for each assessment. Year over year, we have less and less changes, so that's always good to hear. Um, we're going to transition over to trainings now, and I'll, I'll hand it over to Jennifer. Thank you, Tina. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Bourgeois, and I'm the Director of Research Evaluation and School Improvement in the Corona Norco Unified School District in Southern California. And so we're gonna turn our attention now to trainings and we're gonna briefly discuss the trainings available for test administrators and test examiners. The test administrator tutorial remains available. Similar to the test examiner tutorial, this is available in Moodle for test administrators to complete. However, unlike the CAA test examiner tutorial, this is not required. LEA CAS coordinators may choose to use this for their training purposes, and Moodle will provide ways to track completion. Alternatively, they can still choose to train their test administrators locally. The tutorial covers an overview of the summative general assessments, such as the Smarter Balanced Assessments, CAST, CSA, 
test security guidelines, and test administration procedures. We heard feedback from many of you who would prefer the training be publicly available so you may use the web page linked in your resource guide as an option as well. The CAA test examiners must complete the test examiner tutorials in Moodle. These required sets of tutorials are composed of modules covering the general administration and content areas of the CAAs. The general administration module and the CAA for science, ELA, and mathematics are available. A certificate of completion that acts as evidence of training is issued following the completion of the tutorials. New this year, based on feedback from LEAs, is the ability to test out of the tutorial. This option should be offered to experienced test examiners who have been administering the CAAs for a number of years. The new process for experienced test examiners is to watch the What's New videos and then correctly answer all of the uh, quizzes. Experienced test examiners do not have to watch the entirety of the videos in the tutorial. And so for example, for us in our district, how we monitor that completion is with regards to, um, we've done two different models, but mo both of them include uh, bringing the teachers together to talk about the CAA. And then we either have done it where they work on the Moodle independently and they watch it on their own. And then we pay them for that purpose. They submit their certificate. Or we've also used the model where we bring them in for a full day and half of the, the day we talk about the California Common Court connectors, so the standards tied to the CAA, and then they also do their training. That is the model that we use this year. And so then we're able to receive the certificates before they leave and we keep track of that um, through my team. Is there any, um, any of you all on the call from my colleagues, is there anything that you might do that uh, you'd like to share out on how you monitor CAA training? So this is Eric from Central Unified. One of the things that we do in the Moodle, because it's now in the Moodle, is we make sure that we go in and we request access as a trainer so that we can then print or at, not so much print, but view completion reports. Either one, we can download them as an Excel sheet or print uh, or, or see individual uh, people that have completed the ones and we can look them up one by one. So it's um, course completion is the link, but you first have to go in to the website where you got your key from the Sacramento County of Office of Education. And on there, you're going to list up to three people that are trainers. And so once you've done that, and sometimes, frankly, I have to give them a little bit of a nudge by emailing Moodle support and say, hey, I did this last week. We're still looking for trainer access. And then I usually get it within the hour. Uh, so um, if, you if you've done those steps and you haven't got it, just give Moodle support at scoey.net a nudge and say, hey, we filled this form out and uh, can we make sure that these people have access to the um, completion reports? So that's a really great way and it's downloadable in Excel. Thank you, Eric. And to piggyback on the, the Excel piece, um, that is a great way to also monitor that who started and who haven't uh, completed. So, right, so you can see those, the, the process pieces, but um, really encourage you to build out a system, whatever works in your district, to make sure that you have a way to capture who is completed, who hasn't. And then from there, uh, for us, we then give access to CASP. So we hold that piece until they've completed the Moodle training, then we give them access because of the security of the materials. Now, test site coordinators should also complete these tutorials to effectively monitor and ensure that test examiners complete the appropriate tutorials, whichever tests they are administering. The CAA tutorials will save progress for users, allowing users to complete the tutorial over multiple sessions. To obtain the certificate of completion, please note the following. Check that you've completed all the criteria of the course. Completion criteria are met when you have listened to 100% of the audio on each slide and answered 100% of the questions correctly. That's right, it's 100%. Do you either get it or you don't, and you otherwise you can't move on. Also, if test examiners have check marks next to each task in the Moodle course, they should select the certificate of completion and then select get certificate button. 
The certificate will appear in a pop-up window. They can then save or print it from there. The record of completion will also appear in that report that Eric was mentioning. Um, one thing to note also on the, the pop-out window, look for pop-up blockers because sometimes that can be a barrier to see um, the quizzes or the certificates. So that's just one of the things that we have encountered and found the solution for. Now let's talk a little bit about um, the administration materials. As usual, manuals, other instructional guides, and directions for administration or DFAs are updated annually. New this year are the prep preparing for administration or PFA documents. In response to feedback from LEAs, we now have two different documents test examiners administering the CAAs for ELA, math, and science should access. The preparing for administration or PFA and the directions for administration or DFAs. The PFA contains information that was previously found at the beginning of the DFA, such as helpful links, guidance on student responses, and the student response check and second scoring. The DFA now contains only secure information to be used at the time of test administration, such as the scripts, and can be found within TOMS. Test examiners should review the PFA before administration and will still use the DFAs on the day of testing to administer the CAA to students. Because the PFAs are not secure, it is posted on the CAS website on the Directions for Administration and Scripts of Summative Assessments webpage. However, to make it a little easier to find and convenient to download is also available in TOMS where you would download the DFAs. Everyone should download the PFA and review it thoroughly prior to the start of testing. It should also be available during testing in case a test examiner needs it for reference. You can now download the secure DFAs corresponding to the LEA's form assignments for the CAAs. LEA coordinators can refer to the form assignments web pages in the resources guide to look up what form your LEA was assigned to. Log on to TOMS, select the resources tab in the navigation bar at the top of the screen, then select one of the CAA DFA, DFA's items from available materials list to access. LEA coordinators will have access to all forms, so it is important to know which form your LEA is assigned to. Test examiners, if downloading DFAs from TOMS, will only be available or will only be able to access the assigned form. Again, the test examiners will only see the form assigned to the LEA. It is the responsibility of the test site coordinator to make sure all DFAs are securely destroyed after testing has occurred. Prior to testing, make sure you develop a plan for the collection and destruction of these materials. For example, if the DFAs were printed, a test site coordinator might place a sticker with a number for each printed DFA that's distributed, collect the DFAs after testing, and make sure all the numbers are accounted for and then shred all the DFAs. If a test examiner used a digital version, a test site coordinator would make sure to train the test examiner to delete the digital file from the examiner's computer, even making sure that the file was deleted from the recycle bin. For general assessments, the CAS scripts are all, are all a test administrator needs to administer the test. The scripts contain logon instructions for the test administrator and the student. It also includes the say instructions, which are read to the students. Once students start the test, the test administrator just needs to monitor testing and help the students with questions unrelated to the content of the test. Smarter Balanced and the CAST share the same script but the script includes placeholders where the test administrator can replace the assessment name with the one the test administer, administrator is administering and the grade level. The CSA uses a Spanish script. Scripts are non-secure documents because all of the secure content is already within the test delivery system for the student. 
These can be found on the CASP online test administration manual linked in your resource guide. Also, within the CASP online test administration manual is the new resource we've created for test administrators, again, based on feedback from LEAs. In addition to the current process of referring to the administrator on an online test session section of the manual for instructions on how to start a test session, for student login instructions and script, there is also a PDF CASP online administration instructions document available, available for printing and using during testing. Both Test administrators and LEA CASP coordinators have asked for a document that looks and feels like the DFA for the CASP. This document should be all a test administrator will need the day of testing. It is not secure and can be found in your resource guide or downloaded from the CASP website and from the CASP test administration manual. Everything you said is true, but it's not yet available. And I really wish it was before this presentation, but all the links will remain the same. And so just save that link and it'll be available very soon. We're still working on finalizing it and getting it tagged and accessible. Thank so, you for that just, update, Tina. <laughs> just save that link and make sure um, you check back, back again. Um, and we'll also let folks know um, via our news and tips too that it's available. But we're really excited to provide this PDF and hope it's um, helpful to you all once we get it out there. I know my, my district is very excited to be able to have this resource. So thank you all for uh, responding to the needs of the districts. Did you know that all the manuals have a what's new section? This includes the CASP online test administration manual and much more. Navigate to the https colon forward slash forward slash ca dash toms dash help dot ets dot org forward slash for a list of all the CASP and LPAC manuals you will need for this test administration. The what's new section for each of the manuals will provide you with all the information that is new for the 2022-23 test administration year. We're gonna pause for another moment or two for you to process, think about all that you've taken in in this last section. It's also a good time to review your notes, think about your LEA's needs, jot down some ideas, next steps. And it's also a great time to jump on to the Padlet, either add questions, check questions that you've added before and look for responses, or look at what your colleagues have also added. Maybe there's a question that's being asked that it wasn't on your radar and they asked it and it was like, oh man, that's a great one I didn't even think about. So we're gonna take a few, um, a couple minutes for processing time.
So I'm going to jump back to maybe talking about scripts because I saw a lot of questions in the Padlet there um, and maybe about PFAs too. So I can jump back there. So the PFAs and DFAs for the CAAs, those are in TOMS, but you might be a little confused when you go to TOMS. Um, but if you find the CAA DFAs, click that button um, and then choose a grade level. So there's a button for each grade level. You'll find PFAs there and you'll find the DFAs there. So they're all located in the same place and they're in TOMS now available for you to download. And that is only for your CAA. Now for your Smarter Balance, um, those scripts are non-secure. And um, the, as I said earlier, when Jennifer was presenting, they're still being updated right now the 2022-23 version for the, o the online test administration manual is being updated right now, along with the new PDF that we're making. So just stay tuned for that. But that's only for the Smarter Balance, CAS, and CSA. So there aren't any DFAs or anything like that for Smarter Balance and CAS and CSA. And that's just because all of the secure content is in your test administration system. So there's no DFAs for that, but there are scripts to help you as you're administering the test to your students. So I hope that helps some folks who had some questions on the Padlet. All right, um, having clarified that, we're gonna now move on to talking about um, the TOM system and some of the new features, not a comprehensive overview, but some of the new features that are available in TOMS. My name is Eric Wenrick. I am from Central Unified a school district uh, just west of Fresno, California, and I'm glad that all of you were able to uh, to get power and enough internet connection. We know that there's a, a lot of things happening out there in relationship to the storms as we got a, a day or two to dry out before we uh, get the next round. So thank you for uh, joining us, and hopefully we can get this and keep your connections as we go forward. Um, so for Tom's, uh, the test administrator tutorial remains available. It's it's similar to the test examiner tutorial, and it's available in the Moodle for test administrators to complete. Now, remember, uh, test administrators are going to be in in the CAS world. Test administrators are most of the people that will be giving the general assessment, while examiners are those people that are doing the CA. So, the CA test examiner tutorial is required. Um, the CAS coordinators may choose to use this for their training purposes. Um, the Moodle will provide ways to track completion, and we've already discussed that a little bit. Alternatively, they can choose to uh, train your test administrators locally, but you'll want to keep track of that and document that you've done that locally and that they have completed some form of training. Tutorial covers an overview of the summative general assessments, such as the Smarter Balance Assessment, CAST, the CSA, test security guidelines, and test administration procedures. And we've heard feedback from many of you that you be the, prefer the training be publicly available, so you may use the web page linked in your resource guide as another option to getting that done. CA test, let's did it again. The alternate assessment test examiners must complete the test examiner tutorials in the Moodle um, or through one of the other ways we've mentioned. The required sets of tutorials um, are composed of modules covering the general administration and the content areas of the alternate assessments. General administration module and the alternate assessment for science, ELA, and mathematics are available. They get a certificate of completion um, as evidence that the training has been done and it, that gets issued when they Eric? follow that. Um, new this year, based on feedback. Hey, Eric? Yes. I think we're in the Tom section now. I apologize. I jumped to the wrong place, didn't I? No problem. Sorry about that. It's like, wait a minute, we've done that. Yep, print on demand. <laughs> there we go. I clicked the wrong spot when I when you were coming back to it. Um, print on demand changed a little bit to be more streamlined. Um, reaching out to the success agents to request the support is the way you're going to do it now. There is a template um, and you need to do that to make sure that you get the, the right boxes filled out so that they have the information they need to complete that process um, and they need non-embedded accommodations. We'll email the file with the subject of POD, print on demand request, to cafeedback at ets.org. Um, two business days, 
um, during the off testing season for the test setting to be applied during the peak months that's going to be March through May it might be four to seven business days depending on the size of the file and how many other files are coming in um, timeline is based on files with no errors when applying the test setting so make sure everything is complete there as a reminder the appropriate test setting for most significant cognitive disabilities is an alternate assessment determined by the student's IEP team. If the student took the initial IEP, uh, initial LPAC earlier this year, that's going to be automatically, then that student will automatically be assigned to the summative CAST and the summative LPAC in TOMS. If eligible, okay. However, if it is later determined that the student should instead take the alternate assessments, that student must be manually assigned um, to the summative alternate LPAC, and that will trigger the student to be assigned to the alternate assessments for math and ELA as well. Ensure, and if necessary, at the right grade level for the alternate assessments for science. Ensure that your IEP teams and special education coordinators are aware as they develop plans for students prior to January or the opening of the window. Additionally, special education for testing field has to be marked yes now. Um, in order for students to be assigned the alternative assessment. This field is locked, it can't be changed once a student starts their first summative assessment. And remember to change that field, you're gonna do that in CalPADS. All right, thinking about the last example, if a student is manually assigned to the alternate assessment, you may be thinking of the saying, alt for one, alt for all. You'd be right, assuming that alternate assessments in TOMS affect all subjects for the CAST, in other words, by assigning an English learner the summative alternate LPAC, that student is also assigned to the California alternate assessments for ELA and math and the alternate assessment for science, if it's applicable for students in grades three, eight, or that high school grade, if they've been uh, selected for that. Remember, students automatically, if who don't have a science assessment done, will be assigned a science assessment at the end of the process in 12th grade, if they haven't taken one yet in high school. Students with the most significant cognitive, cognitive disabilities who are found to be eligible for alternate assessments must take alternate assessments in all content areas. Okay, are there any examples of students planning to take the alternate assessments in April who took the summative LPAC in February? Um, so if that happens, and it's happened to us a few times because in my, in my district where a student has an IEP in that time frame that may change them, usually in my case, it's been going to the alternate assessment. So they have taken a regular general summative LPAC and now they need to take the alternate assessment. So it's something to pay attention to when those changes are happening. Make sure your SPED staff know what's going on and notify you. I ask them to do that as they're completing IEPs to notify me of any changes to the testing section is how I do that. And if my colleagues wanted to chime in and add other examples of how they uh, kind of make sure that they're tracking those. One of the, um, the things that we leverage are the reports within SACE, because our district uses SACE for our special ed um, a team to document their IEPs. And so we leverage the uh, reports within SACE, looking at the assessments and where they're signed. And then we load those into a shared drive where we ask the sites to validate the, um, the assignment. And then from there, when they have confirmed that everything is good, then our team then goes back into SACE to make sure that the assignment has been added to the IEP, it's been affirmed and attested. And at that point, that's when we assign the alternate assessments. So we have multiple sets of eyes looking at it to make sure that we're com in compliance with the rules around uh, who takes the alternate assessment after we've done the training, of course. And then also um, the IEP, making sure that we're in uh, compliance with the IEP. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, as Moses alluded to earlier, um, a lot of our stairs cases and appeals uh, revolve around students that are on individual education plans. Um, a student can only be assigned accommodations if the student's CalPAD special education setting is yes. 
If that student's test settings are not correct, the LEA has to file a staircase to reset the test and the student and the test examiner has to start over. And in a couple of my schools, which are second scorers, they may have to start all over again. So you wanna make sure you do all those processes to try to get it right as they're going in and make sure, particularly for your students on an IEP, that your staff that know and work with those students on a regular basis are checking up on those students to make sure they're getting exactly what they're supposed to be getting according to their IEPs. As part of the process of scoring all assessments, readers and the automated flagging process also come across student responses that warrant an LEA's immediate attention. Um, this time of year, they do this um, during the regular set, regular course of the year. So if you're doing IEBs and FIBs that involve writing, or sometimes even in the note-taking guides, the system catches that and people review that and send stuff through the new CAR system, which we'll be talking about. But right now, the alert system, um, things that are experienced or have experienced some kind of physical or emotional abuse or neglect, where a student may be harming themselves or threatening to harm others, or if they're experiencing severe distress, these will get flagged um, and they you will get notified. Right now, Tina, correct me if I'm wrong, but right now it's via email not through the car system that's coming, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, so ETS reviews all of the flag notes to determine if a, it is a notice is required. Um, this is true for both CAS and the LPAC. Alert papers regarding constructed response items um, or in the writing domain for the summative assessment will be sent as they are being read and, and constructed responses are being read and scored. Um, many of you um, experienced folks are familiar with the process. Years ago, they used to be um, sending it overnight mail by UPS. Now it's coming by email. Um, so it's evolving and getting a lot faster so we can notify people a lot quicker. Um, this year, the way in which you'll be receiving is, is changing. Um, previously, again, it, it was paper, and now it's starting to come through a, a combination of emails and TOMS, and eventually will be... Um, more in, in in the CAR system, the crisis, and that stands right here for crisis alert um, review system. Once ETS has determined that the alert should be sent, Tom's will send an automated email to the superintendent and to the LEA CASP coordinators, both primary and secondary coordinators, um, during business hours Monday through Friday. The automated emails will be sent every three hours until somebody goes into CARS and acknowledges that they have seen that and are dealing with the situation. Um, that means your superintendent every three hours might be getting pinged until somebody does it. So if you're um, the only LEA coordinator in your district and you don't have somebody serving as a secondary coordinator, uh, might be something you wanna consider. Um, in TOMS, the incident can be viewed in, in the CARS, again, Crisis Alert Review System CARS. The alert status is listed as new, acknowledged, or archived. Users can acknowledge an incident if it requires additional action or acknowledge and archive an incident if it can be closed out. Doing either of these actions puts a stop to those notification emails. So it's up to the LEA to create a process on how to address uh, student crisis papers. In my district, we notify our lead psychologist as well as the psychologist and the counselor and the admin at the school site um, via email. And then we, we haven't had one come through CARS yet because that's brand new, but we used to then um, send them a separate email the same way the system would send us a separate email with the password to unencrypt to the secure document with the content that was concerning. Um, and then we just make sure we're following up with them. So as we do that, we'll also be able to send them um, information from the CAR system and have them uh, be able to see what it is that the student wrote and the appropriate people will be able to respond. Um, and as you said, Eric, the the process hasn't changed. We're just kind of giving you a preview of what CARS will be like um, once incidents get reported in there. But for now, the process is remaining the same. You'll still get emails um, from ETS. Um, but we wanted to give you a heads up on what the system's going to look like in the future. Yeah. And with the recent reboot this week, many of you have noticed probably like I did that CARS is now a, a little uh, part of the blue bar 
uh, drop downs right past report. So kind of right right off the right end of that bar. Um, so it's it's starting to uh, starting to come online a little bit. All right, uh, student score reports. Um, new thing here. We all of these languages have been available in the past. You'll notice Korean is being added for this year. So we've got that um, coming up right now. So that's the the new language there. Um, so next, we're going to talk about um, some of the resources for accessibility. Um, we'll discuss the changes or updates. Um, and as a reminder, accessibility resources include the universal tools available to all students, designated supports available to any student where an educator has deemed it necessary, and accommodations available to those students with an IEP or 504. Yeah, I think you could just power through it and I can hand it over to Heather. All right. Thank you, Tina. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Heather Finch. I um, am from Aspire Public Schools. And as Tina mentioned, we'll power right through into our next section, which is on accessibility resources. Um, and we'll talk about changes and updates related to these. As a reminder, accessibility resources include universal tools, designated supports, and accommodations. So for a quick refresh, universal tools are available to all students and do not need to be assigned in advance. Designated supports are available to all students, but do need to be assigned in advance based on a determined need. Accommodations are available only to students with IEPs and 504 plans, and they do need to be assigned in advance as well. We'll highlight some additional resources in this section that will be helpful for learning more about accessibility resources. So here are a couple updates to start off. Beginning this year, embedded text-to-speech in Spanish is now available as a designated support for the Smarter Balanced Assessment in Mathematics. This resource is not listed as a separate resource in TOMS. Instead, it's automatically activated when a student is assigned the text-to-speech resource as a designated support and the dual language stacked translation resource. So you can think of it as the results of those two resources combined together. Keep in mind that this resource is intended for struggling readers so if it's not used regularly during instruction, it's likely to be confusing and may impact the student's performance on assessments. So as with all accessibility resources, it's important to consider thoughtfully before assigning. Additionally, there are two new training modules available for educators to watch on demand at their own pace. Module A is called Matching Accessibility Resources to Student Needs. Module B is Using Accessibility Resources in Daily Instruction. These were created to help educators understand the basics of what accessibility resources are, why and how they can be used on assessments and in daily classroom implementation. The modules include video trainings, and they also have linked resources and planning tools available for you to download. This is where you can view trainings on how to assign test settings individually or by batch upload. I know that was a question on the Padlet, so you can watch those videos there. Um, and we hope these videos help prepare educators to better recommend resources for their students to do their best on the test. Um, I do also want to talk about in TOMS, there is a test settings report that site coordinators can pull to view all of the test settings that have been assigned to students. Um, and I really appreciate the feedback on the Padlet around, um, you know, potentially um, having a different report. So thank you for that feedback. And I also just wanted to appreciate, appreciate Chad for naming that he'll look into that and sort of take that back to the team. So thank you so much for that feedback. Um, moving on to some notable resources provided in your resource guide, again, that's on today's Padlet, um, are accessibility resource demonstration videos. 
on the Accessibility Resource Demonstration Videos webpage, you can find videos of many different types of test setting tools that are available for students. So you can watch a demo of what some of the universal tools look like. You can watch a demo of what some designated supports look like. For example, if you need to look at what text-to-speech looks like in the computer interface or masking, check those out. The newest videos created were some of the most requested. One is the read aloud video and two is the scribe video. Both of these videos demonstrate what those resources are, the difference between the two and when to use them for students. They also show real life examples of how each resource is used during the assessments. So to visit the YouTube playlist of demonstration videos, visit the link here, bit.ly slash 3tb8s51. And now we're hitting another pause moment to allow for some processing time so go ahead and take a couple of minutes to review your notes and check out the Padlet to take a look at questions that have been posted or maybe post your own question that has come up. All right, I think we can move on. All right, so next let's talk about test administration updates and reminders. So first, the test administrator interface or TA interface is where test administrators or test examiners will go to start a test session monitor testing for the CASP and the computer-based domains on the LPAC and where they'll pause or stop a session. Users can access the TA interface from the CASP and LPAC homepages. And this is a helpful link for test administrators and test examiners to bookmark during training so they know exactly where to go on test day and can pull it up quickly. Most users in TOMS are able to test students who are enrolled in different schools in one test session if the user has a role in each of those schools now. So in the past, LEA CAS coordinators have always been able to administer tests to students in their entire LEA. What's new is the ability for site CASP coordinators and CASP test administrators to test students in multiple schools. But the key is that they must have roles set up in TOMS for those schools. So for example, if I were testing students in school A and school B, I need to be assigned as a test administrator for both of those schools in TOMS. And this is important. When I create a test session to assess those students in multiple schools, it doesn't actually matter which school I select, I would still be able to test those students based on my roles in TOMS. Um, LEA coordinators should still remind and caution test administrators that students still need to be fully supervised and 
you should ensure that the different schools are part of the same testing window to avoid accidentally testing a student after the test window has closed. And this is a helpful reminder that test examiners have the option to start a test session live in the moment, or they can schedule a test session in advance. One thing to remember and continually communicate is that if a test examiner is scheduling a test session in advance, they still have to log on to the TA interface and actually start the session. It doesn't just launch automatically. So remember that both options require manual setup by the test examiner, as well as their monitoring of the test session. These test sessions, if you choose to schedule them in advance, can be scheduled up to two weeks in advance once your test window opens. And another really important piece of information to clarify for your team is that security forms need to be signed in TOMS prior to test day for the test to be available in the TA interface. Otherwise, you won't have access to the test that you're supposed to administer. The test does become available about 30 minutes to an hour after test security affidavits are signed. So again, it's recommended that all users sign those forms well in advance of test day, so you don't have to deal with that wait time. And it's a good idea to have folks just log into Tom's and sign this live during your training so you know that it's done. Um, these forms are really easy to sign because they're completely paperless. The first time you log into Tom's, you will see a prompt pop up to read and sign the digital form. Test coordinators have two signatures. They must sign the test security affidavit and the test security agreement. Users who have a test administrator or test examiner role will sign only one document, the test security affidavit. You will have a way to monitor test security signatures by running the security forms and remote administration status report in TOMS if you're an LEA or site test coordinator. This report will show you who has and has not signed, as well as what time the signature was done. So if someone reaches out because they tried to start a test session and all they see are the interim assessments, you can check that report and verify you know, that maybe they completed the signature only 10 minutes ago, and it likely needs more wait time to process. There are some roles who might interact with secure, route, secure materials, but do not need access to TOMS. Um, think janitorial staff or classroom aides. The process to complete and submit the test security affidavit for non-TOMS users with roles that, again, do not require access to TOMS, um, that process is online and must be completed using the link in your resource guide. So there's no longer an online form for non-TOMS users to complete, which is different from last year. Now it's just a PDF that LEAs can download and provide to non-TOMS users to complete locally. So you'll also want to have a plan for site coordinators to file and store those non-TOMS signature documents. All right, Tina, hand it back to you. Thank you. Um, I'll point out something you said, um, especially on that Tom's uh, security agreements and affidavits. I think that's the number one question we get is my teacher can't see the assessment that they're supposed to be administering and what do I do? And that's really the key right there. They need to go into Tom's well in advance and get those security affidavits signed in Tom's. And then at that point, they can bookmark the TA interface and be able to go into the TA interface really smoothly. Otherwise, if they bookmark the TA interface link um, and they go there, they might not be able to see those tests if they haven't signed their uh, security affidavits beforehand. So that's really key. 
So we're at the end of our session. So I just wanted to leave you all with some key resources that you can be found at the end of your resource guide. We've given you lots of links and lots of resources throughout the resource guide. But at the very end, there's some um, that are also just universally helpful. So that includes the CASP and LPREC website to go to for any information you might need. We have news and tips on the very front homepage there that you can look at too. Uh, the notable uh, web pages are the upcoming training opportunities web page, so you can see any upcoming trainings that we have, and there's also past training, so for example, this recording will be posted on the past training opportunities web page um, via our YouTube. There's also a checklist for LEA coordinators, so if you're new to your role or if you need a checklist, like a to-do list, you can download those check uh, those coordinator checklists. They're Word documents, so you can edit them um, and modify them to your own needs. There's lots of manuals available. Most notable is the online test administration manual that we talked about earlier that um, is getting updated right now, so you, you can go and read um, some of that information because not much has changed based on the uh, presentation today. You notice that not much has changed from year to year, just small little things. Um, there's also a web page that lists a lot of helpful quick reference guides and videos linked on there, along with practice and training tests. So you can share that with your site staff and your students to make sure that they're well prepared and familiar with the online test administration system. So that's really key. We also send a number of emails, especially to LEA coordinators, so make sure you're receiving those emails from us. And if you happen to lose any of them, we archive all of the emails that we send out. And so we have a link there um, on where to find the email archives in case you want to see them. Additionally, we have resources for parents and guardians. So there's a web page specifically um, with, a, with just a few resources to support parents and guardians as they support their child with testing. Um, and then there's uh, about each of the assessments under test administration on the CASP website. Um, there's uh, a tab there for all the different assessments, resources for each of those assessments and just helpful information. So there's a lot on that resource guide, but we hope um, you save it and just reference it throughout the year as you're looking for materials or looking for answers to some of your questions. And if you can't find the answers to your questions, there's some other ways to obtain assi assistance. The first one, like we talked about, is going through the website and looking through all the information we've given you. And if then you can't find the answer you're looking for, the California Outreach Team has LEA success agents that are assigned to the specific LEAs. Um, the best way to get a hold of them is by email. Um, chat is the next best option as well if you need some real-time assistance. And then there's also the California Technical Assistance Center or CALTAC. Um, that one you can call in and it's being staffed by a few uh, call center representatives. And if for some reason they can't answer your question, they'll route you back up to your success agent. But that phone um, representative can answer very basic, basic questions um, that you might have. So we'll take some time and move into the Q&A portion of this. And we can pop over to Padlet to see if there's any questions we want to address out loud. Um, does anyone have any they want to bring up first? I can jump in. Uh, there's a question about um, the Smarter Balanced Adjusted Blueprint that is being used again this year. So it's the shorter assessments that were rolled out during the pandemic that um, the CD and the State Board of Education have agreed to continue using. And so we are using that Adjusted Blueprint um, or that shortened test for the Smarter Balanced ELA and Math specifically. There's some questions about the Moodle training site. Um, there's a lot of different trainings on there. Um, specifically for CAS, there's the test examiner tutorial, which is required for test examiners to complete. Um, we did change it just like 
and Jennifer mentioned earlier, we did change it slightly this year so that if you have experienced test examiners who have been doing this for year over year, they can just go through the checks for understanding um, and watch the what's new video, and then they can get their certificate of completion. If they're a new test examiner, we really do highly recommend going through all of the videos and going through all of the courses um, to get their certificate though. One thing I'll mention about the test administrator tutorial, so that's the one if you have folks giving the Smarter Balanced CAST and CSA. The test administrator tutorial has a new video in there called How to Administer a Test from Start to Finish. And so that new video um, has real life students going through um, a uh, mock test. And so we're really grateful for the school that was able to record that video with us um, and hope you, hope you and your test administrators find that helpful when they're preparing for administration as well. So definitely check out that video. Does anyone have any questions they wanna bring up? I'm looking through here, Tina, and right now I'm not seeing any jumping straight up. Well, maybe the headphones one, there was somebody that asked about headphones and just wanna, um, the secure browser uh, is a lockdown browser, so there can't be any conflicts. So. Um, if your students are bringing or using their own headphones, they have to be wired to plug into the computer. So we, in my, in my experience, I've used both the um, monologue or the audio portion where it's the singular port. And I've also used headphones that are USB, um, but you would definitely want to test those out ahead of time. Interim assessments are a great opportunity to pilot that and make sure there's no conflicts. Um, but it will cause the secure browser when it's open, it will say there's a conflict and it won't let anything happen. So um, no Bluetooth. Okay. Um, I was looking at the test administration updates column on the Padlet there, and there's a question now at the top about um, the test administrators rarely ever sign into TOMS. They go straight to the TA interface. And I just wanted to sort of make the point that, yeah, they that's true and they don't need to do that to do an IAB an FIAB or an interim comprehensive assessment so when it comes time to do the summative they will need to have that test security affidavit signed and so it's important to run the report that's available in TOMS and follow up with people that haven't yet signed that before they uh, get to their testing day so just a, a hint for making sure that people um, have actually completed that step it, it, it is a, a little bit different I developed just a little bit of handout with a couple of screenshots that I always send my new users when we create their CASP account saying make sure you go in and finish the process by signing the test affidavit and it walks them through clicking on toms and making sure that they actually get in there so um our list is not hideous but it, it there's definitely people that still miss that step and it will be necessary before they do a summative assessment eric and i just want to piggyback on on what you said because because of last year we had quite a few hiccups where the user experience, because that was not done, was not a good user experience at the very beginning. Um, there is, in the training this year for the slide deck, there is actually one of the slides right then and there is for the test site coordinators to take their teachers into the system and sign their security affidavit during the training. And we're hoping that that's gonna be a way to um, mitigate that problem this year. It's worked, uh, pretty well so far with the feedback we've heard on the LPAC side of the house, because we're also using that same uh, structure there. I know it's not um, typical for test administrators to go into TOMS for testing too, but one practice that we like to suggest um, for test administrators is to just look in TOMS to see if their students have the correct test settings assigned. So if you ha happen to have um, a test administrator with a lot of students with um, a lot of complicated test settings, that might be a really good recommendation for them to go into TOMS beforehand and make sure, because they know their student best, so they can look in TOMS and go student by student or pull a report to see 
if their students have the correct test settings, because then on test day, they might discover that and that'll um, kind of create some issues on test day. Well, there's there's more questions popping up now. I see that somebody's asking about suggestions for getting SSIDs for new students in a timely manner. I think Moses has spoken eloquently at this point before. Is you've got to have a great relationship with your CalPads person or people, um, and make sure they understand the importance of getting those SSIDs into the system quickly. And then you also have to let your test coordinators uh, particularly, um, and sometimes even teachers directly, that it's going to take a couple of days. When you get a new student, it's not going to be. It's going that 72 hours is a real thing because of all the different systems where the record has to make its way through. But if that CalPATS coordinator can do that on day one, then you're only waiting 72 hours. If the CalPEDS coordinator is only refreshing their files every few days, it could delay it even longer. So it's really important that, that those updates are being done as timely as possible. And your CalPEDS coordinator understands the ramifications and, and reasons for doing it so promptly. I want to come back to security affidavit for a second. There's a great question in the chat because I think all of us have experiences where we send the email out and then the, for some reason that the test administrator doesn't see it. And then that short little time frame that they have to click the link when it's active um, and, or they can't find the email. So um, they can go to the CASP website and go into Tom's and they click forgot password and it will generate a new email for them and they can go from there. So. We've used that process and empowered our test site coordinators to be able to help um, problem solve right on the moment if it's there. But anyhow, yes, they can click forgot password and um, it's good to go. Yeah. And if for some reason forgot password isn't working, and this is usually the case yeah. for our people that are logging in for the first time in any particular year, even if they've been doing it for years because the system gets recreated every year. Um, and so I say, if you've not used it yet this year, you might click first time user, even though you've been using it for 12 years or whatever. Um, I don't think it's been around quite that long, but if you've been using it for years, you still have to click first time user sometimes if you're past that 30 minute window. So instead of reset my password and so that, that can also um, help some people get in. Tina, there's a question that hasn't been answered in the Padlet that I think is important, especially right now with LPAC window opening, it's regarding that new feature, the very helpful new feature of being, that, that's referenced on slide 41, that I know we referenced it with regards to CASP, of being able to test students from multiple sites. And that also applies to LPAC. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's correct. Sy System-wide, this is an improvement. So that, that question, uh, is a great one, especially now as you, some of you are starting to get ready to open your LPAC testing window. Uh, I talked about the shortened blueprint for the Smarter Balanced ELA and Math. There is no shortened blueprint for the CAS. That remains the same. Um, the CAS blueprint was revised in January 2020, so it's still fairly new to some people. Um, the key difference uh, being what uh, we were talking about earlier, or Moses discussed earlier, having the discrete items and three PTs that represent the various uh, science standards. And in your resource guide, there's a link to the organization of the CAS, so you can kind of take a look at what students um, will see when they're test when it comes time to test. So they might get discrete items and then discrete items in the first two segments, and then a discrete item in the third segment or a PT in that third segment, and then the rest will be all PTs. So you can take a look at that for more information too. And let me make a plug, Tina, if I made to that question and thank you, Chad, for addressing that issue of the wireless earbuds that so many kids are using and the, a danger that is inherent in using those is what Chad just pointed out. And please keep in mind, if you if you have schools, which I think all of us have schools that are being audited by the independent auditors, I know that a lot of those auditors 
come from the world of also auditing tests like the 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 um, the national assessments, the SATs, where students very often have been very devious in trying to use wireless devices to access information. And in this era of smartwatches and smart devices, that is something that I know that our auditors have looked at and students that are using wireless earbuds. It is a very dicey proposition that as Chad points out, needs to be attended to. And so that's another one of the reasons why, aside from everything that Jennifer mentioned in regards to the connectivity issues and the bandwidth and issues with the secure browser, there's this other very important issue that we need to attend to, which has always been said is one of our greatest responsibilities, the integrity of the assessments and the issue that comes into play with students that are using everything from hoodies with embedded uh, earbuds and the possibilities of those bringing up the issue of test security. So please, please be very careful with that also. Smart watches too, Moses, I'll add that one in. Um, yeah, I did just want to lift, I'm seeing more questions about um, links to send users about signing affidavits and agreements. And I just wanna reiterate that there isn't a separate link that you send to them. Um, there is a PDF for non-TOMS users that you would download and print and have those non-TOMS users sign, but for TOMS users who are test administrators or test examiners, your action items would be to set them up with roles in TOMS. They would receive an automatic email notifying them that they've been set up, and they can click on the link in that email, or if time has passed, they can go, as Jennifer mentioned, to Tom's and select forgot my password to generate a new link. And they'll log into Tom's through that link. Um, and the first thing they'll see when they log in is a pop up for them to sign their test security agreement, or sorry, their test security affidavit if they're a test administrator. Um, and then Eric, I, I see a shout out in the Padlet um, requesting you to share your guides for how users sign in. So um, thank you for sharing that with the group. And you know, thank you for asking about that. I'll, I'll I'll make a I'll probably put it in Google Share folder and just make that available to anyone with the link. And Julie, your your understanding and explanation of this issue that was just brought up and that the guide that Eric is going to share addresses is correct, your understanding is correct. As long as the test administrator has on their account an association with the multiple sites that the students are coming into that session from, that session and that session ID can be accessed by students from multiple sites, which is something that's very, very helpful. I know that nowadays when we're, especially we're still some of us doing remote administration of these tests, and we have students that are associated with different CDS codes, as long as the test administrator on their account has the different CDS codes associated with their TOMS account, that session that they create can be accessed by students from different CDS codes. So if I'm not mistaken, and my colleagues, if I'm reading her explanation right, that is accurate, Julie, and how you're explaining the use of that new feature. Yeah, in my mind, the um, the use of that is going to have the students in person with you, but those students happen to be in different schools, right? And the, the person giving that test has the user role for all of those various schools, and then they can start that test session. I wouldn't imagine the students to be dispersed into in different places. Um, so just to make that clarification. We did have a question about the TA tutorial. Um, everyone, or I shouldn't say everyone, but if you're an LEA CAS coordinator, you should have received um, a email announcing that the TA tutorial is available and it's available in Moodle. 
It's also available publicly. So if you wanted to um, avoid using Moodle, um, you can give your test administrators a link to that public site. Um, and just keep in mind that you want to be able to track locally if you want to track locally um, how they complete that because there's no completion tracking on CAST.org like there is on Moodle. So just keep that in mind. So if you're using that public site, you don't have to give your test administrators a Moodle account. Tina, there's a question um, in the in the Padlet that I think is an interesting question, and it asks about materials available to share with parents to discourage them from opting out their high school student from CAST in CAST. Um, to my knowledge, there would there is not anything that we put out there as far as to discourage them in a formal way. We do notify them of their rights because as a parent, they do have the right to opt their student out of the CAST assessments. But for us, what we do is we help them to, the, the parents to understand um, the impact of when they take the test, what it connects to. So for example, and this is specifically the high school student, um, we uh, do put a lot of emphasis around the state seal of biliteracy, for example. And so when we have had parents um, reach out and to a high school and say, we wanna opt our kiddo out of the test, our site administrators are equipped with the information that by choosing to opt your student out, which they have a right to do, they're removing the following uh, opportunities to earn. One of them is the state seal of biliteracy because the, uh, as we all know, the ELA test is tied to that. The other piece is we talk about the golden merit. So we come at it from the perspective of an additive approach. And then the last piece that we also talk with the parents about is, is that um, that information is really valuable for us as we look as an organization to see how we're doing and then also to support the students for um, placement in a class that maybe they need extra support in math or ELA. And so we really look at the EAP portion of it and really partner with our um, California um, State University, so the CSUs, on how those two things connect. Um, but again, it, it goes back to building connections with your parents and your counselors to help make that make sense. And so it's, um, they end up, oh gosh, I didn't know. And they're, they're like, okay, no, I don't want to opt my kiddo out. Um, but they have the right to. And so we never come in and say, you can't do it. It's really about coaching them around the benefits to taking it um, and not just for the California School Dashboard or not just because of this, but it is what are the benefits that a student receives because of taking it. And that's really important. And as a former high school a teacher and assistant principal and so forth, I remember those conversations and can want to make sure that we continue that work as we work as a, as a district. Anyone else have anything they do to coach their parents up around the positive reasons why they should be taking those tests. Well, Jennifer, I, I know that especially for small schools, there's that whole other issue of the accountability factor and how it affects a, a school's uh, performance measures. So, especially the smaller the school is and that 95% uh, per um, mandate comes into play and the possibility of that affecting a school's California dashboard accountability measures. I was noticing a question just about classroom teachers that are only doing um, summative LPAC for entire groups. And there is a recommended video for them to watch. It's just one little video on administering to whole groups. And I believe, and, and others on here, help me out, that's, that's in the Moodle as well. Sorry, could you repeat that, Eric? Yeah, the question was about classroom teachers who are only administering the um, 
LPEC summative assessment to whole groups. So they're doing the, the portions that are like the reading or something that could be administered to a group of up to 20 students, depending on the grade level, um, and not doing the speaking portion of it. So there is a video that they are um, recommended to watch before they go and do that, that walks them through kind of the steps and the procedures for that. I was just trying to remember if it was on the main website or on our, the LPAC.org website or on the Moodle. I believe it's on the Moodle website. It's on the Moodle website. I think it's called something like grade three through 12 group administration. Um, and it's within the summative Moodle training. But for those test examiners, they wouldn't have to go through the speaking calibration right. since they're not they're not doing that domain. Yeah. Tina, I, there's a question about the um, high school grade level for the LEAs to administer the CAST. And um, so I want to throw this out there as something to really, um, our goal is to test the kids by the time they graduate. So if we know that outcome in mind, I think that's really important. Um, for us as a district, we chose grade 11. And so when we got to the end of the year, we were monitoring the data and we noticed we still had kids who still hadn't tested. And why I'm bringing that up is because when we reached out to ETS, um, we found out that we needed to um, unassign the test to those kiddos because we wanted to make sure that we gave them that opportunity in grade 12 to take the test because we are still trying to hit that participation rate. And it is my understanding that if we assign it in grade 11 and they don't take it, it counts as, as basically their one time opportunity. And so um, just make sure that stop you right there and did that change that. yeah I'm, I'm gonna pose that as a question to my cd friends and uh, maybe they can add it in padlet but i believe that changed and i'm just gonna do a little oh. research on the back end to make sure but that you can just was... share your logic on why you chose grade 11 and then if you have any grade 12 students as i research that Yes, so grade uh, we chose grade 11 as it relates to when um, with our sequence, right? So part of what the conversation was around is what is the sequence of the kids and how they're taking their tests and or, I'm sorry, their classes and because uh, of the standards that are being measured. So we chose grade 11 as a district for the three, if you will, the three course model. And then from there, we also had a conversation as a district as it related to we feel that in grade 11, students are also more focused in, um, in taking the test and so forth. And then the last piece to that is we also every year look at grade 12 to ensure any new kids that we have coming to us or anyone who hasn't taken it, they're on our radar with uh, who has to take it. So yes, grade 11, but then we can also review the data for the following year to make sure we haven't missed any grade 12 kiddos. And I hope, Tina, you find good news because that was an extra layer of work that we, our team will be super excited if we don't have to do that. <laughs> yeah. And for those that might be newer, just remember that unless the student is a senior, you're going to have to make sure that you either one by one assign those or upload a file. And Jennifer, if I can just add, our our line of thinking covered exactly the same kinds of considerations your look, uh, your district took into consideration. We then had to move on to bringing in our curriculum folk in science to really make sure that to the greatest extent possible, the curriculum maps and assignments that were being incorporated into the science instructional programs of our high schools benefited the students to the greatest ability possible to be tested in grade 11. Because not necessarily are your courses are gonna be aligned to make that the most ideal grade. So we, after all these wonderful considerations that Jennifer put out, the curriculum and instruction people need to come into play in regards to looking at what the students are receiving in science instruction to make it the most advantageous for them that we assess them in grade 11. So that really had to come into play as a next step to making sure that we were attending to the best possible scenario for our children.
Um, Jennifer, there's a question for you. If you can re you repeat um, the process you have uh, towards tracking affidavits and then tracking who completed training. Oh, for the Moodle calibration? Maybe. Maybe we're talking about CAA tutorial. I'm going to go with that to start with, and then maybe they'll put in the chat for clarification. Um, so with regards to the Moodle uh, calibration quizzes um, for our, our teach, we use this actually in our LPAC process as well, but um, our teachers, when they complete the CAA training for Moodle, uh, they download the certificate and then they send it to our, we have a designated email that they send it to. And then our team um, keeps track of those. And then that's when we add their account access. So we don't add their account access in Tom's until they have completed their Moodle because then they, with that access to Tom's, they have access to the secured materials. And so um, from the perspective of test security and so forth, we and it's and it and it is the test. So we really hold that really tight and not release their access until they have completed the Moodle. Now, there have been two models we have used in the past as far as how they complete the training as far as timeline. So in some cases, um, well, in both cases, we bring them in to go over it as a group um, outside of the, the Moodle, and we go over some requirements and things like that that are locally uh, related. The one option we have done is that they have done the Moodle training independently and they we have paid them for that all those good pieces and they've sent the certificate uh, the certificates into us via email afterwards it could have been a you know a day later could have been a week later but they had a timeline to complete it the most recent one we've done which is the one that i am super excited about the this direction is we brought them into uh the district and we did it as a two part. So part of the day, they were talking about the California Common Core connectors, which are the standards that the students are being measured on. And so really trying to connect the instructional part to the test. And then the second part of the day was about the Moodle calibration and they completed it within the day and submitted the certificates to us before they left the training. And the feedback that we have received from teachers is they appreciated the fact that we were doing a, a heavy lift of connecting the dots for them around teaching and learning. And it's not just a compliance piece, it is for purposes of measuring student progress. So we can make sure that all of our kiddos are um, progressing. Thanks, Jennifer. That is, according to Anonymous, that is the process that that they were interested in, so thank you. Um, and I also answered that question about the high school grade level and linked to a PDF document that uh, states that if a student is registered in grade 10 or 11 and they don't take it, they're still eligible to take it in grade 12. So they can still take it in a future administration. So we so, don't have to unassign. This is gonna be the best news for my team, let me tell you. <laughs> um, and then, for the question about how many students can we have in one group session, I know Eric gave some guidelines for the LPAC. There aren't really any um, required or restricted guidelines for the CAS, so it's really up to the LEA's discretion, but um, I'll let any of you chime in on about that too. Basically, we follow the practice of if you're getting bigger than your normal day-to-day -day classroom, um, you need to have other people helping you out. Um, so if you're pulling them into a library or a cafeteria or heaven forbid, we've done this in the past, the gym um, with huge numbers of kids, you need to have a team of people with you. Okay, I'm going to back up one more second and just say that if a student was exempted from the um, CAS, like if they had a medical exemption or if they had a parent guardian exemption, that counts as their one chance to take the CAS. So just keep that in mind too. Okay. 
All right. Any other questions that folks feel like we can answer out loud? I know um, there's a new a new uh, column on the side called locally created resources where Eric was able to link to some of the resources folks to ask for. So thank you very much. Any new and then if anyone I'm sorry, Tina, I just have to piggyback on that. Please, any new coordinators of the 298 that are still here, take a look at those two links of those two individuals that have shared uh, incredibly valuable, the two, the both Eric's and Anonymous, who is Leah, great, great resources, new coordinators that can save you a ton of time to have these colleagues have shared those incredible resources. Thank you, Tina. Yeah, thank you, Moses. With that, we can take the last few minutes to do a screen share. Um, and I can walk through new resource or resources for new coordinators as well. Let me do that. So I just want to caveat to say that this presentation was called What's New for CAF? And that is because it's geared towards experienced coordinators or people who have been doing this for a long time that don't necessarily need the nitty gritty and they just want to know what's new or what's new for this year and updates right but i recognize that there's a lot of new coordinators with us and hopefully still with us and so i can show you a few things that will be really helpful we're on the cast.org website and under test administration um, all of the web pages for each of the assessments are really useful. If we go to manuals and instructions, I'm going to select that link um, and scroll down to the 2022-23 checklist. There's the LEA CAF coordinator checklist that we talked about. There's a checklist for your site coordinators that you could modify before you send to a site coordinator if you want to, along with test administrators and test examiners. So that's going to be really, really helpful. Um, if you're a new coordinator, you can take a look at that checklist. And once you look at that checklist, you're gonna find out that there are new coordinator training. So it screams your name, new coordinators, and we could do some filters for CAF, the new uh, filter for new coordinators, I can even filter for coordinator. Um, and this is upcoming training. So we have an upcoming training for new CAF coordinators. This one um, is put on by local, County Office of Education, so you can take a look and see what's offered. Um, additionally, there's some webinars in the future that are really helpful. And because we're in the middle of the year, we've already had trainings that pass by, and so you can go to training and then past training opportunities and materials, and then do the same filtering. You can do coordinator, new coordinator, CAF. Um, and then there was a training in December that was hosted by a bunch of County Offices of Education, so you can get the note-taking guide for that. Um, there's a webinar in October that was held, a webinar and a training in September that was held. So you can kind of peruse at your own pace these resources and see what's helpful to you. Additionally, you can reach out to your local um, regional assessment network and see if, uh, if you have someone nearby that can kind of give, show you the ropes and give you some help and guidance. But the folks on the line are also going to be really helpful and valuable resources as well because they've been doing it for a while. So if anyone wants to chime in on anything else you want me to show or just suggest, feel free. I just want to really emphasize that new coordinator, those new coordinator trainings are super detailed and even a seasoned um, a test site coordinator um, going back and reviewing those components is just, it's, it's great information. Um, and highly recommend uh, looking, at least looking at the resources, even if you're not able to attend. And I noticed on our accessibility resources, it's still kind of white. And I just wanted to say, 
thank you to those that kind of contributed to the ideas um be our actual we've changed that one to green now but um contributed to the ideas of developing new reports and things like that i think it's important that um you know those of us that are presenting here are from local lea so we're not in charge of making those decisions but there's obviously a team of people backing us up including tina and others um, who are looking at kind of what reports we need out here in the field and it's great to, to hear from everybody and to make some contributions to uh to improving our systems so thank you all right well um we only have a few more minutes left we answered a great deal of questions on the padlet and again this padlet will remain up um, for you all Oopsie. this padlet will remain um, forever alive so that you can re refer to it um, look at other people's questions if you haven't had a chance to and um, look at the answers that were provided as you go through this administration year um, one of the reasons we do use Padlet is so that you can refer back to it at any time and it gives um, it gives us the opportunity to give you a lot of resources and links, et cetera. Um, something I will make a plug for is that you're going to receive an evaluation for this um, training series. So if there's any changes you want made to our trainings or any trainings in particular, you can give us some feedback. So if you like the Padlet, if you prefer a Zoom Q&A, those are all valuable feedback for us because we definitely want to accommodate to what works for everyone um, or what will benefit you all as, as virtual learners. With that, I think we can um, say goodbye and say happy Thursday. We are here. If you ever have any questions, um, reach out to your success agents. You can reach out to any one of us. Um, and I think that's it. Stay safe and I hope everyone's staying dry. Thank you again for joining us today. Eric, there's a comment um, in the chat about your enrollment key is on that document. <laughs> I just wanted, I, I didn't know if we we're gonna jump out. I just wanna make sure you saw that because yeah, it's still there and and, Thank you to the person looking out for you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I did. Yeah, you got to have to substitute your own enrollment key. I think I put it out as a PDF. I will. I'll take that down and put it out as the Word document. It started from with the generic XXX key. Thanks, Jennifer. Have great. a great one. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.